lakshigunam anantam nirvikalpakam om shanti 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 hearing about brahman the reality is good taking teachings on brahman is better meditating directly on brahman is better still and best of all is that meditation Brahman, which the reality doubt, is about good the nature of reality dies away forever om peace 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 may peace be unto us and may peace be unto all om hari om You are welcome here in the precincts of SRV Associations on the Big Island of Hawaii, where after a few weeks of, of uh, vacation, as it were, we are appearing to you with a live streaming satsang. And we have our retreat in Hawaii coming up this week on making essential spiritual connections, part B, because we did the first half last year. So we're all coming back and meeting we for that. And after that, we're going to you back to our usual live with a live streaming satsang. Of a series of classes. And we have our retreat in Hawaii Hawaii coming up this week on so we'll making some of those essential spiritual connections. connections. Part B, because we did the first half last so, year. Satsang. So we're all coming back and meeting for that. And after that, we're going to you back to our usual live with a live streaming satsang. And we have our retreat in Hawaii coming up this week on making essential spiritual connections. Part B, because we did the first half last year. So we're all coming back and meeting you that. And after that, we're going to you back to our usual life. With a live streaming section of series of classes. And we have our retreat in Hawaii coming up this week. Making essential spiritual connections. Part B, because we did the first half last year. So we're all coming back and meeting you that. And after that, we're going to you back to our usual life. With a live streaming section of series of classes. And we have our retreat in Hawaii coming up this week. Making essential spiritual connections. Part B, because we did the first half last year. So we're all coming back and meeting you that. And after that, we're going to you back to our usual life. With a live streaming section of series of classes. We have our retreat in Hawaii coming up this week.
the time of death and after death, Avidya is c quite common. That's ignorance. <laughs> see. And uh, aparavidya, lower knowledge, also quite common. Secular subjects, schooling, all that. See. But paravidya is very rare. So I wanted to give you that little and my usual kind of preamble to any kind of event. When we start to sit like this, uh, cross-legged with our breath controlled and our spine straight and our minds focused, uh, because that position, that manasana, that, that asana, if you will, is seen on serious people, on people who can focus on deeper matters. I mean, you don't really see it on people who can focus on, in math and science, they're usually slouching around reading a book or drinking or smoking or whatever, uh, slouching at their desk in school or whatever. But when you see this position, you know you're in the atmosphere of serious people who are looking deep into this nature, this true nature. And uh, so this is, has to do with these first two questions, Atmuchar. We should get to the questions so we don't run out of time and we can get everyone's question if we, if we want. I want to adjust it so that you can see it eventually. That's better. There's so little. Now, that later, but let's take up these questions on Atambichara. Actually, before I do, though, there's a question here that maybe is even more in keeping with a preamble like uh, the likes of what I just did. It has to do with evil. <laughs> now, Vedanta doesn't usually water the weeds. It waters the flowers. So you don't hear a lot about evil. You don't hear even that much about suffering in Vedanta. In, in Buddhism, you will, and yoga you will and so forth. But Vedanta pretty much cuts up here, you know, it cuts at the, at the throat. And so it, it, in other words, it assumes you're a mind right now. You're not a body and you're not even prana. One of the questions here is about prana. But it assumes really you're a mind. And this, it's why it's part of the mind-only schools. You see, these great teachings of India are called mind-only schools because they know that everything from the mind down came from the mind. That is, it would have to be thought and, and, uh, and uh, energy. Man does not live by bread alone kind of energy. Called, we call it prana and body, physical bodies and planets in space. All kinds of physical bodies have come from the mind, actually, as concepts first and then as solidified properties using the five elements. So at first everything started off in the mind, you see. And like I was saying about that question, somebody told you in high school, it started off in God's mind even before it started off in yours. There's a name for that in India called Mahat, the Great. It simply means, if you want to put it into English, Mahat means the Great. So it's the Great Mind. And it's at a universal level. In other words, there's a collective level. Uh, 
gods, goddesses, deities, celestials, ancestors, humans, animals. You know. I mean, that's all kind of a collective mind. And then there's an individual mind, which is each one of our minds, our brains, as it were, uh, and their capacities. So those are two kinds of mind, but there's a third level of mind called mahat, or, or universal mind, or cosmic mind, sometimes they call it. So if you were to plug that in, then you would know what they mean when they say, basically, we're looking at you as a mind, a Vedanta. We can't look at you as Atman yet because you haven't realized Atman. Atman is beyond mind. That's soul or spirit or Buddha nature or, or uh, other names that have been given for it in different traditions. That's beyond name and forms, beyond thoughts, beyond intellects, beyond thinking and all of that. So there's a separating the wheat from the chaff or making finer distinctions in these inner realms that we're talking about. All right, so there is a preamble to the preamble. Now we get to the question about evil uh, and how Vedanta might want to deal with it. Let's read it first. I recently shared with someone my belief that even people who commit heinous acts of violence also possess inner divinity at their core. So he's talking to his friend about this. My friend disagreed and said that he believes human beings are inherently evil. I know that as Vedantists, we don't go along with the idea of original sin. But when I shared this conversation with one of my Sangha brothers, we both thought that perhaps we remembered you, that's the guru, saying that there might be truly lost souls, the demoniacal ones, who do not possess this inner divinity. Could you please help clarify this for us? <laughs> I can certainly give it a try. Um, I'd have to take it into portions. First of all, original sin um, is, is a concept in Christendom, of course. And it's not necessarily that Vedanta doesn't fully go along with it. it. It can entertain it as an idea. There is such a thing as fallen souls in Vedanta. We just call them ignorant, that's all. The word for original sin in Sanskrit would be the equivalent, that is, would be avidya. They're simply ignorant of their true nature, that's all. So if you started right there in the middle of this paragraph sentence here, you would say that pretty much clears it all up if you continue thinking along that train of thought. There are just people who have forgotten their true nature. That's all. We don't call them sinners. We don't paint a black mark on their soul and say they'll never get free. Uh, in fact, we would say in Vedanta, they always are free. They've just forgotten their own freedom. They've forgotten their own true nature. Now, can you forget your true nature so much that you can actually begin to commit heinous acts? Yes, of course, it happens all the time. Uh, but does a tiger attacking a gazelle, for instance, and eating it, tearing it to shreds, is that an evil act for the tiger? So when you bring up heinous acts, consciously heinous acts, you see, then you would have to, in, in Vedanta or in yoga or in India, you would, you would begin to think more along levels of karma, you know, cause and effect, than you would along lines of, uh, of uh, condemnation, uh, judgment, reformation, uh, so forth, uh, um, and salvation. That, that's a different direction. Vedanta goes more towards karma and cause and effect as the ultimate explanation for something like this. Beings who can commit heinous acts will be born again to pay off these debts. And I don't think Christ would disagree with that. In fact, once they asked Christ, who was it that sinned that the man was born blind? The father or the mother? Or the man himself, the boy himself? You see, he was born blind. Who, who was at fault there? The father, mother, the parents, or the, or the son? And Christ said neither, because he was thinking along lines of karma. That man committed some act in a previous lifetime, and because of that act, he was born blind in this lifetime. So uh, it's not his fault in this lifetime. He's just paying off the debt, you see, of his karma. So Vedanta wants to go towards a more practical solution and explanation that gets rid of guilt and shame and that kind of overlay, because it's not productive. Uh, you want things that are productive that can help you 
work your way out of negativity. So, uh, do does Adolf Hitler, Hitler have the, have the Atman in him? You see, if you want to put it directly, does a, does a soul who has committed so many heinous acts have the Atman in him? Yes, the Atman is in everything, irregardless of place or location or gender or any other difference that relativity poses. There, uh, Atman is there in everything, even objects that don't have the ability to act on their own. That is, don't have a nervous system, don't have a brain and so forth. We have to think of Atman or Buddha nature as this all-pervasive oneness. It's not a numerical oneness because that has a limitation, but it's an all-pervasive oneness. And just like you might say, if you exposed a, a, a tub of water to sunlight, things would start to grow in it when nothing was there to begin with. In that same way, as an analogy, if, uh, if uh, this ocean of consciousness gets exposed to the light of these worlds, then things begin to grow in it, just naturally and then they also dissolve back into it. Things are coming forth and merging all the time. And of course this is the act of nature. But in Vedanta, nature isn't sentient. It's insentient. There's another force behind it. Actually another of these questions explains that or gets to that explanation better. So what we would say about things like eternal damnation and original sin is that uh, there is another hand that writes the Book of Destiny. I mean, that's probably the best way you could explain it. That was Holy Mother's teaching, Shisharda Devi. Whatever Mother wrote in the Book of Destiny, she can also erase. So karma is reversible. These heinous acts are reversible. And uh, once a lifetime goes by in ignorance, you don't even remember the heinous acts you did, nor do you remember the good acts you did. See, once you're in this lifetime, who remembers them? Only a person who meditates and uncovers them has that kind of power, that kind of penetrating power to go back into the subconscious uh, mind. I'm not talking about the brain, I'm talking about the mind, because in the mind is the memory of all things, see, at the collective, individual, and cosmic level again. The mind holds everything like that. Smriti Hetu, it's called. It's, it's a cause of memory. So there's a subtle cause for all of your acts and all of your thoughts and they're all pinioned together. And, and uh, if you can find them and disperse them, then your karmas will be neutralized and you'll be free again. See? In Vedanta, everything's an overlay over formlessness. Formlessness is a reality, and whenever th everything is, turns into a form, it's, it's an overlay, it's a superimposition, sort of like, now you see me, now you don't, right? So this is an overlay, a form, over the thing that you're looking at, which in that case with a capital T would be Brahman or formless reality. That formless reality is not subject to good nor bad, nor virtue nor vice or pleasure or pain or any other pair of op opposites. You see. It's ever pure. In fact, Sri Krishna said about it, it's the only thing that can't be defiled by the tongue or by the acts of mankind cannot be defiled ever. So if you make room for that in your in your <coughs> way of thinking, in your life's philosophy, then it pretty much answers a question that, like that before it even comes out the gate of your mind. See? You just have to plug in certain um, principles that are tried and true, again corroborated by scripture and the words of the seers and, and sages, and then all of a sudden you can make sense out of something like that, like Christ could with the blind man or with the leper or with anyone, the adulteress or any other person he encountered. He didn't see a sinner there. He just saw uh, an act with its karma that hadn't been resolved yet. And he was just there to show them how to resolve it. Now there's another way to approach this question. I don't want to take too long with any one question, but another way to approach this question is that Vedanta thinks about all of the world as being unreal. Worlds of name and form and time and space are all projections of mind, so they cannot be real, not ultimately. And the way to explain that in a word is mutability. 
or changefulness. It's changing all the time, and so nobody can keep track of it. What to speak of in one day or one lifetime or many lifetimes, you see. It's a constantly shifting array. It's shifting sands all the time. It's called phenomena by the Buddhists. And nobody can keep track of it. The word in our tradition is maya. In, in Japanese, it's mayoi. And Zen, 52 generations later, out of India, calls it mayoi. So it's been there all this time as a principle that is very hard to put your finger on. But if you have a word and a and a, then you have a way of explaining it. You, see? you think, oh, he's getting too wordy, you know. I don't like words, I'd rather be silent. Well, maybe if you're at that level where you can be silent and see the truth, more power to you. But the Zen masters themselves say that uh, if you can't explain your realization in words, then you probably haven't had realization. Mm -hmm. see? So these words become very important even to people like Zen masters who are known for their silence, you see. So it's not like you throw words out the window. So anyway, by this way of saying, a word like maya or mayoi, or uh, even uh, words like um, samsara, which is rounds of birth and death and suffering and ignorance all the time, have to be figured into the quotient. Now, if you look at the world as being posited in that constant changefulness, then, and none of it being absolutely real, then how can a heinous act be real? And how can its effect be real? And how can even working out a heinous act, that is neutralizing karma, that wasn't real either. See, It was an assumption. You took it on, you saw through it, it went away, and you were back to your own true nature again. Sort of like an expression that passed across your face, right? Or a sweet meat that went down the throat, as Ramakrishna used to say. See? You forget what it tasted like a few seconds later. So all of these fleeting experiences are like that. Whether they're bad, whether they're good, or whether they're mixed. They're all constantly passing. They leave an effect, and that's all you need to know. And if you can neutralize the effect, then once you do, you'll see that both cause and effect were unreal. And that there is no cause and effect in absolute reality. Now, what do I have to do? From Shruti, I heard it. From Yukti or Manana, I rolled it around my mind. Now I have to realize it. I have to realize the truth of what was said. And store that in back in my repository of undeniable experiences I had. See, that, that are as rare as hen's teeth, but at the same time will never let me down. So then when I see 100,000 people dying from some heinous act, then I won't get thrown off balance. So I'll know that ultimately it's a show and that that's been happening for hundreds and thousands of years, probably hundreds and thousands of yugas, that is cycles, that beings have been born and died and not one thing has changed because of it. <clears throat> the only change possibly that could happen is that you lifted yourself out of the play. See? in all its facets, you, you got tired of dreaming. It's mass collective mental dreaming that's going on in cycles there, you see, if it's all mind. So if you want to wake up, then you'll do away with the dream and you'll realize you're the dreamer. There are actually songs in India with those kinds of lyrics. Oh, dreamer, awake, you must, you must. You see? So these are two different ways you could ask you could answer a question about evil and its suffering and so forth in Vedanta. And uh, both of them probably are well applied. Uh, they will do the best to, to manana, to contemplate those kinds of things for a long period of time until these questions will not arise anymore. And you will yourself, of course, the person who asks this question is probably not a heinous being doing, not an evil being doing a heinous act and is a very good being doing good acts. But the same applies here with good acts in Vedanta, is that they also are a kind of gold chain. It's not like you just have to get over evil and then everything's fine. There are many people who are very good, but they're still caught in rounds of birth and death in ignorance. Good people are caught in these rounds. So Vedanta doesn't stop uh, to uh, pat you on the back, you see. 
it wants you to go the full distance and it's going to make sure that uh, it provides you with every means possible to do that take it to the full uh, the full field you see nine yards isn't good enough you have to go the full hundred yards to to get the goal get to the goal so uh, in that way then uh, you can see how Vedanta deals with a question that usually doesn't come up in its in its periphery uh, like I say it cuts very high when you come into Vedanta and it's, uh, uh, it's, I would say that because I heard yesterday uh, read some article about um, a Shaivite who was saying that you know Vedanta is only for the few because it's more for the higher intellectuals and for people who uh, have a, a deeper, higher mental understanding, but that it leaves a lot of people high and dry because they can't comprehend it. So I would say that's not necessarily the case. I'd say that Vedanta has its dualistic level, it has its qualified dualistic level, and it has its non-dualistic level. Yes, if you're talking about the non-dualistic level, that's a rare attainment. Those beings, Krishna, Buddha, Christ, and others, you know, they had something very special, obviously, because they made a huge impression on the world. So they had to deal with beings who were very astute or beings who were lost, totally lost souls. That's the expressions used here, you see. Original sin and lost souls. So when I shared this conversation with one of my Sangha brothers, we thought that perhaps we remembered you saying that there might be truly lost souls, the demoniacal ones. But I would say those are two different beings. The lost souls are the fallen, the lowly, patita pavana, the Savior will come and save them. But the, demi the demoniacal souls have found, they're not lost, they've found evil, you see, that's all. So those are two different kinds of levels of souls. Lost souls can be good, but they can be uh, totally lost. That is, they have no inkling of their true nature yet. And they may just do good acts of, of uh, stupefaction, or they may do bad acts of stupefaction, or they may do mixed acts of stupefaction, and not know why they suffer the effects or why they enjoy the effects. So that's the, to put it in Holy Mother's way of saying, the inexorable law of karma. It's inexorable. Nobody can figure it out. Uh, and when you begin to focus your mind away from relativity and on the reality, then it's not that you figure all this out, it's that it goes away. It wasn't real to begin with. It's sort of like darkness in a cave. You, know? you bring in a torch and you know, darkness has been there a thousand years, but you bring in a torch and it's gone in a few seconds. See? So it had no substance, this thing called darkness. It just hung there. So it's the same way about the darkness in your mind. Um, you know, it's it has no real substance, and therefore it should have no control over you. It should always be lit up, as we were saying before we started. You see, oh, I went to in Vrindavan, India, and it was lit up. The village was lit up. You saw spirituality there. People were were living in a higher state of mind, and so forth. My brother and his son just got back from the trip there. So that uh, can also be said about people who are lost and then people who are under the evil star, you see. Uh, that, that's a light and darkness, good and bad, virtue and vice, pleasure and pain. Those dualities will always be here in the mind. And then uh, that's why Vedanta wants you to go beyond your mind. It had you go beyond your body at some point and how do you go beyond prana, breathing, and life force, and all that? And one wants you to consider the mind and go beyond that, too. Go beyond them both, Sangras and Bold, say Om Tat Sat Om. So you know the truth. That's the great Mahavakyas. And let's move on to those questions. So that takes up uh, one of the, the uh, biggest questions here that's uh, suitable for the beginning. Now, these next two questions are about Atma Vichara. What are the preliminary steps needed for the mature and correct practice of Atma Vichara and formless meditation on I am? Well, there's another uh, you know, 
asmi would be the way of saying it in Sanskrit. If you, that's why I brought a chart here, uh, so we can refer to some of these sayings. Again, atma vichara, atma or atman, the indivisible self within all beings and all things. If you don't like the word self because it smacks too much of the ego, that's good, fine, I agree with you. Uh, but you, you could say Buddha nature, but maybe you don't like the word nature either. <laughs> so words will be full of limitations like that. But it's this all-pervasive, timeless, deathless awareness or pure conscious awareness in, that pervades everything. It's, it's there to be picked up on. You know, so your mind is like, a, like an antenna or a receiver. You know, all of a sudden it awakens up and it picks up on pure consciousness. Then it falls low because of the influence of karmas and samskaras and gunas. Uh, sort of things, cycles of awareness that get weighty and heavy in any given time. And it's now all of a sudden it's not susceptible uh, or it, it can't receive those higher waves of consciousness anymore. It just falls out of them. It doesn't mean they went away. It means that you weren't able to hold them. Because that would go back to this question about evil. You know, evil beings just fell out of knowing their true nature and so they, they got messed up mixed up in uh, a lot of heinous acts and so forth, and now have karma to pay. So it's going to be a, you know, a long time possibly before that karma will come back to them and they'll be able to neutralize it, because spiritual practice is what neutralizes karma. There's a question here about japa next. That's the doing of, the repeating of Lord's name and how that, how that uh, works into it. But before I leave this question, Atman, the indivisible, Consciousness, pure conscious awareness in everyone that's nameless, formless, timeless, spaceless, deathless, birthless. You have to uh, make sure you remove all overlays from it so that you can have the best chance of understanding it. And vichara, how to inquire into it. So uh, now defining the term then, the question is, what is the preliminary steps needed for uh, entering into this? We pretty much already answered that question by sitting here. You need to sit like this. You need to breathe. You need to empty your mind. You need to have a teacher. You need to hear the, dar the Dharma expounded upon. All these are preliminary steps for understanding, for entering into Atma Vichara. But it, you don't find it out in the world. You can go knock on every door. You can go to every school. You can go to every club, every social club. You can look around, knock in there and say, are you guys engaged in Atma Vichara? No, sorry. Okay, I'll go to the next door. Are you engaged in Atma Vichara? No. What's Atma Vichara? So it's not something very common. You'll have to find beings that are, are uh, illumined preceptors, gurus, dharma teachers, and sanghas. Sangha means a group of people who are interested in finding out the true the truth, see. You could say meaning of life, yes, but uh, meaning of life isn't very high. In fact, you could even make a point eventually when you found eternal life that there is no real meaning to life. There's only, the only meaning is in eternal life. Christ was actually very good at explaining that. Birds have nests, boxes have holes. You have no place to lay your head here. I mean, what does that say to you? That there's no meaning here on earth. You can't build your house on sand. You have to build it on bedrock. So bedrock is eternal life, you see. And when you live it, you glow, you shine, you see, and, and you know what you're talking about, and the truth comes to you, answers come to you. And uh, you know, you're never left high and dry. You make your way to the goal from the goal, along the path that is the goal. It's all one essence. You're pouring essence into essence. Ya dhaka mishude shudama siktum tadrageva bhavatum. Evam iver munair vijanata atma bhavati gautama. Means pure water poured into pure water becomes the same. And so become those great ones who uh, realize their oneness with Brahman, with Atman. Atma gautama. So if you pour pure water into pure water in a ceremony, then uh, that's exactly like you pouring your consciousness back into Brahman or into Atman, back into your true nature. So, 
um, you'll find people <coughs> looking for a way to do that. And along the way, if you want to, preliminary steps needed will be to neutralize your, your negativities. If you took up the path of yoga, say, right away, Padanji would tell you, klista vrittis, you've got negative thoughts. See? There are klista vrittis. What's the, what's the way then, sir? A klista vrittis. Encounter the negative with positive thoughts. You see, This is an ancient yoga that they picked up on and sang songs about even in Las Vegas. You got to accentuate the positive and mm -hmm. so all that kind of thing, you see. But basically, it has its roots way, way back in uh, vibration of the mind. A person like Patanjali, father of yoga, who studied the, the vibration of the different minds of his students, and then went about finding a way to remove the negative, to, to smooth out the negative vibrations. And when he did, or anyone did, then they found out there were also positive vibrations there. And those were acting as a barrier, too. Because you see lots of positive people in life, but did they ever get enlightened? Mm -hmm. Very few of them. So positivity alone isn't going to do it. You see, stiff upper lip if you go about with all positivity, but the world is... is uh, people are committing heinous acts all around you. Politicians are, business is. Uh, are you supposed to ignore it with a positive attitude? You go out with a smile on your face. It's not enough. So, so then you're going to have to get to the the depths, the root of the problem. Philosophical problems, you know, like the nature of suffering. The nature of suffering, if I look into that, is going to depress me. You see, because there's this whole ocean of suffering out there, and people who are lost in it for lifetimes. So, gee, that doesn't look like much of a solution. Maybe I should look into the nature of my true self. I need something to contrast this ocean of suffering with. How about an ocean of bliss? See? So, Ananda Samsara or Ananda Sagara. See, do I want the ocean of sweetness and bliss and love and light or do I want to stay in this ocean of suffering that people are cycling through in, you know, throughout ages and lifetimes? So you have to have something very, very light-filled to contrast it with. So correct practice of Atmavichara would include all of those things. You have to take them all on. So basically, the quote we started out with, you know, see, I need, I need a teacher, I need a, a path, and I need to hear the truth, I need to reason about it, I need to realize it. Uh, that's both a declaration and a method. If you need a method, then Vedanta, in its qualified level, will suggest one to you. At the same time, it'll say, don't get attached to the method. See, Because why? Because you're already perfect, you just don't know it yet. So then I would disagree with the first question. That human beings are inherently evil. No, that's nowhere the case. Um, they are inherently divine by nature. But you might say they would have to transcend their humanity. Human beings, they're going to have to go beyond the human species and they're going to have to go beyond beingness. What's beyond beingness? See, is this absolute non-dual truth. It's not a matter of becoming and being, it's a matter of your true nature being ultimate and absolute everywhere in every location at all times. And you, you know, very rare to get a glimpse of that, even a glimpse, like a third eye opening, as sometimes they say. Now this question here goes on and says, how does japa help to facilitate deepening of Atma Vichar? Actually says, how, why, slash, how, slash, why does japa help? Well, definition or defining of terms again, japa is, is the repetition of God's name with your beads. We call it rosary in Christendom. So you have a beads, 108 seeds of Rudraksha, say, seeds on it, and, you, and you, you know, you're given a mantra by a teacher and you repeat that mantra on these beads. Maybe do 108 
<coughs> or maybe 216, or maybe 324, or maybe like Holy Mother, hundreds of thousands a week for the benefit of others pretty soon. You're not just doing it for yourself. So you're, the name of the Lord is sweet to taste. See, as one song in India sings. So you, you get a taste for the name of the Lord that's represented by the mantra and you repeat it over and over again. Well, that's going to get rid of your klistavrittis and then it's going to help you transcend your aklistavrittis, your good vibrations, and you're going to reach a neutral place where there's just all light. Satchitananda. Pure existence, pure knowledge, and pure bliss. See? It's one of the beautiful words for divine reality in our tradition, Sat Chit Ananda, see? or Sat Chid Ananda. So Japa will help you then in reaching this higher end. But I would say that uh, the why maybe is, is suspect there. You see, Atma Vichara doesn't usually proceed by Japa. Japa, by doing Japa, you may find yourself with better means for performing Atmavichara when it comes along. But Japa has its own practice. It's, it's an end to a, to, a, uh, to a goal, to an ultimate goal. So you do it as a devotional practice. You have to have the mantra, you have to have the bijam, and you have to have the ishtam. The mantra is given to you by the teacher. The ishtam is your chosen ideal, say Durga, or Kali, or Shiva, or Ramakrishna, or you have a and then, then you have uh, the um, um, akutraman too, the actual japa beads of 108 seeds or something. So, and then you practice it, the art of repetition. So it's its own practice, and uh, it must be done with devotion, heart's devotion. You must water it with the tears of your devotion. These seeds, you see. So it's very interesting. There's outer seeds, right, called rudrakshas, but there's also inner seeds called the mantra, the, the words, like om and aim and hrim and so forth. These are bijams of ancient, ancient, and very powerful. So when the, the guru gives you that and you practice it, then the beads are out here, but the seeds are out here, but the seeds are also in you, right? So you water those until they uh, implode, basically. You split them. It's like splitting an atom outside, but here you're splitting the atom of wisdom inside. And it gives rise to elation, to ecstasy, to bliss, to knowledge, to peace. All these divine qualities, rain cloud of virtues, they call it in yoga, begin to occur, uh, suggest themselves to you. And say, Whereas before, when you did the japa practice, it wasn't there. Well, then at that point, maybe you can say, well, who am I? <laughs> then you're approaching a level of non-duality. Japa wasn't really about non-duality. It was about doing away with your negative thoughts, with a positive thought called a bijam, and taking a teacher who is a form, and thinking about an ishtam like Ramakrishna, who is also a form in your mind. It was all about duality, wasn't it? So it, in that way, that's how it prepares you. But why it prepares you that way, they're two different practices, see, Atma Vichara and, and Japa. I would say they're great to work them together, but they're working at two different levels of your mind. It doesn't necessarily mean that one person needs to do Japa in order to get to Atma Vichara, because there are some people who are not devotionally oriented. There are also some people who did their job in another lifetime. So you hand them a beads and they go, oh, I remember this, yeah, and then it falls out of their hands. See? And they walk away to find some, somebody who can tell them about non-dual truth, because that's, that's where they're headed now, that's where they're at. So accomplishments in previous lifetimes has to be figured into any given soul and the makeup you know, teacher and the, and the student should confer like that, say, you know, wh where are you? How far along are you? What are your obstacles? And what are your good points, you see? And then this, this fashion, a method that's going to work for you individually, and each individual is going to be different, like a thumbprint. Mind is different. So some of them are accomplished in some ways and not so much in others, and vice versa. 
So a person who's more non-dualistically oriented is going to take to Atmavichara like a duck to water. And a person who has devotion to God with form is going to take to Japa. They can't wait to get the beads going, you see. It'll start smoking mm -hmm. in their hand. All right, so those two about Atmavichara. We've covered three of these questions, and uh, we have time to take a few more. Hmm. Here's a simple one. Does Vedanta or yoga have their own versions of walking meditation that is found in Buddhism? What is the point of this practice? Well, I've done walking meditation at a Zen retreat before. I've had experience with it a little bit. And, you know, it's um, at the basic level, it's let me rest my knees and legs for so much sitting in Zazen. <laughs> God, he made me sit eight hours. I've got to get up and walk, you see. So I'd say it has a very practical. You can hardly wait to get up, you know, and walk out in the garden. See, maybe, you see, you're just so grateful that you don't have that pain anymore, you see. <laughs> and all of a sudden it puts you in a higher state. <laughs> but on the other hand, walking meditation, you know, can be and should be ultimately, ideally, um, uh, seeing God in everything. That's how, that was how you would label it in Vedanta. There are even books in Vedanta, one of them by Swami Sharananda Sacramento. When, in my day, when he was still alive, we went to Sacramento, and Swami Sharananda was, was there, and he wrote this beautiful book, Seeing God in Everything. So um, in Vedanta, that's kind of the idea. So in Buddhism, it's a practice, you see, but uh, that's at a lower level. See, it's, uh, it's uh, mindfulness exercise, right? And everyone who's into forms of Buddhism, whether it be Tibetan Buddhism or Thich Nhat Hanh's Buddhism or Zen Buddhism, is aware of this kind of practice in Buddhism. And it's just becoming mindful. And it's good for people to do that because they're moving too fast basically. Things are going by them too fast. They're walking by the tree. And they don't know that uh, Buddha nature's in the tree. I heard a Zen master say that recently, or read about it. He says, uh, Buddha is the trees. You know, so you're moving by the trees, and you're not seeing the Buddha. You're just seeing trees go by. So you've lost track of that Buddha nature or Atman you know, in everything. You're not, you're not even entertaining the possibility that it could be there. You know, there's a beautiful teaching that there's the outer tree. This is actually a Buddhist teaching Dalai Lama gives. It's an outer tree, that's, but they call that the illusion tree because it's made of swirling particles. It's, there's, a, there's a real tree and it called swirling particles. That's the actual tree. So there's an illusory tree you're seeing. And then if you're more scientifically oriented, then there's a swirling particle tree, that's, that's the real tree. But the Buddha nature tree is inside of the real tree. It's even a third level, you see. And that's consciousness tree. That's the treeness of the tree. And there's the goldness of the gold, and the silverness of the silver, and the manliness of man, and the womanliness of the woman. Krishna goes into that in the Gita. So when you're at that level of very high Atmavichara, and you take that mind from Zazen or from study and it's in a very high level and you walk outside. It's an entirely different experience than when you just go out in a blasé sort of state of mind. Everyday state of mind. You see. And you begin to uh, uh, f uh, breathe the prana that's in the air. You see, And you begin to get the prana out of the food that you're eating. You see not just the taste of it. It'll taste better too, of course, but you're actually just uh, uh, taking in the essence that's out there and, and, and uh, turning it into superlative experience inside of your own mind. You see, it's all more about consciousness. So, I mean, I said it was a simple question. I don't want to uh, make the answer too complex, but I would say, yes, it's a mindfulness practice in Buddhism and I'm not comparing or contrasting it to Vedanta. I'm just saying in Vedanta, you would say just it's more about seeing God and everything. 
That is, when mindfulness practice reaches a mature place in Buddhism, you'd be seeing Buddha nature in the stone, in the tree, in the dog, in the person, the same way Krishna says you're seeing the same Atman in all those things in the Gita. And the end of those four questions, it says here, thank you, peace and om. Mm -hmm. So I send my the same back to you. Now there's one more question here on this sheet of paper. I have a question for today's satsang. In terms of connection between the mind and the prana, life force, is all prana governed by thought? If all thought is all thought manifested through prana, what does Mahavakya, what does the Mahavakya I am prana signified? All right, so this young student, I know who this is, uh, has sent this in. First of all, I have to say I've never heard of a Mahavakya called I am prana. Uh, here's the Mahavakyas, these are the traditional ones. Aham Brahmasmi, Ayamatma Brahma, Pragyana Brahma, and Tattvamasi. Uh, you can see that it has nothing to do with prana, it has everything to do about Brahman or true nature. Nameless, formless, birthless, deathless, timeless, spaceless, transcendental consciousness that's permeating everything. Not only is it transcendent, but it's also right there imminent in everything. But it, since it has no name and no form, it's sort of like trying to see air, it's sort of like the water getting, the fish getting together at the bottom of the ocean, arguing about whether water exists or not, because mm -hmm. they can't see it. Right? So, Oh, my great grandfather was a great fish, and he said water existed. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, they're schools of fish, right? So they have to get together. <laughs> so it's sort of like that. In the same way, so we can't see air, but we're not denying that we live by it. In the same way, the spiritual seeker can't see Atman and explain it, but knows that that's what everything lives by. So this questioner says prana. So let's clarify that question first. No, there is no Mahavakya called I am prana. If uh, if you're really into life force, then that's when you say that. You see? <laughs> but attachment to life force is one of the things that recycles you in rebirth all the time. People have a very strong attachment to life force. Patanjali, the father of yoga, calls it <coughs> abhinivesha, clinging to life. It's one of the five obstacles to spiritual life, is clinging to this life, clinging to this body, clinging to this energy, even clinging to this thought, especially if it's lower thought or heinous thoughts. You see. So other great statements are there. I am pure consciousness. I alone am all. I, I, all is Brahman. I am Atman. I am all. And so forth. Brahman alone is real. The world is unreal. I mean, there are all sorts of great sayings in the Upanishads and the scriptures. Uh, so, the, but the four classic Mahavakyas are there. And you must do inquiry into them too. Inquiry into the meaning of the great sayings. So that's a kind of form of Atma Vichara, isn't it? It's all talking about you, really, your true nature. They're bringing you to that point of you, who you are. And so the question is, who am I? It's a famous question in Atma Vichara. So let's start at the end of his sentence there, the end of his paragraph there, and answer that first. There's no Mahavakya called I am Prana. Um, but, back to this question that is more relevant, in terms of the connotation between mind and Prana, life force is all Prana governed by thought. Ultimately, yes. But, after you die, then your fingernails continue to grow. There's a Prana that is actually still in your dead body causing your fingernails to grow, you see, and your hair to grow, and so forth. So you wouldn't say directly that that's governed by thought, because your mind and brain are gone by that time from the body, and they're not directly causing prana to move. But that's kind of you know, nitpicking, I'd say. When you look more into something like this chart that we looked at before, um, and I didn't really bring the charts here to make, um, you know, turn them into a three-hour class like we do with them usually on Sundays. Uh, uh, we've looked at this within the last few months and went through this entire chart in one of our class series about the connection between mind and prana. And there's even a word for it. I mean, we're 
talk about lost souls. I think Americans would qualify, you see, many of them, because they have no idea about inner life. And it's not, that's not a, you know, uh, uh, casting negative aspersions on, on America, because when Christ went amongst the fishermen, they had no idea about inner life either. They were fishermen along a river, that was it. They had loaves and fishes and huts, but he said, you don't have an inner life yet. So it's like if you're a, a denizen or a participant in this thing called embodiment, mass embodiment, on a, in a, on a physical level in a world, and you don't know how you got there, then you don't know about prana and how it moves the soul, the mind soul, that is, in and out of states of awareness, from waking, dreaming, to deep sleep and back, for instance. You go into other worlds tonight and sleep and come out not even knowing it. But illumined souls go in, and you know, they don't come out foolish like us. Remember my teacher saying that all the time. Fool goes into deep sleep, comes out a fool. But an illumined soul starts illumined, goes into deep sleep, sees what's there, and comes out illumined still. So he's seeing all the kingdoms of heaven within, that there are these levels of consciousness inside, which are actually the sources for this. Like, like when we say there's a outer tree, a, you know, a, a illusion tree, a, a real tree, and then a Buddha nature tree, we're actually kind of talking about those very same three levels, aren't we? Waking, dreaming, deep sleep. And uh, that there are at least three different levels to, rea to uh, consciousness. An illusory one, a more real one, and then you know, a, a more absolute one. The three worlds, they call it. It's a teaching that's just, you know, is, uh, inundates everything that's come out of India as far as philosophy goes, the three worlds. So AUM of OM is indicative of the three worlds, and the OM is the word. In the beginning is the word, the word is with God. So, you know, that all of that has to do very powerfully with, with these uh, movements or these supposed movements that we're taking, and we're taking them by prana. I mean, right now we're breathing in, we're holding, and we're breathing out. That's the three worlds. It's waking, you know, it's dreaming, and it's deep sleep. It's birth, it's life, and it's death. Breathing out is death. When you die, that's the last thing you'll do, is your final out breath, you see, when you leave the body. So right there in one breath is prana, you see. It, what is it that's causing you to breathe? God? Food? Man does not live by bread alone. There's a, there's a life force in you that's causing these movements, because God is beyond movement. He doesn't sit there and make you breathe. Watch billions and billions of souls breathe. He's aware. It's not even a he, actually, so it's hard to speak about it, you see. But uh, it's not like this divine being that we're calling God, or Brahman, or Allah, or Yahweh, or whatever name religions give him, give to it, that's beyond gender, is sitting there watching your every move and is on pins and needles seeing what you'll do next. A good act or a heinous act, you see. No, it's not like that at all. It's that you're down here in the realm of prana, you see. You've taken embodiment. And so here you are um, with uh, this, in this embodied state and breathing in and out and holding your breath and so forth, uh, almost unbeknownst to you, you see. Um, it's all involuntary, as they say. See, and your dreams tonight are involuntary. See. And quite often people even start practicing meditation. Their meditations are involuntary. Well, let's just see what happens. You see, maybe God will show himself or herself to me, you see, in some way. So, you know, it's consciousness and lack thereof. So I, I don't know if I don't want to get too far afield here, but the idea of prana, you know, is uh is uh very important. So when he asks here, the, the connection between mind and prana and how it governs thought is very important. So there is a kind of prana that governs, governs the digestion of our food. It governs the excretion of our food as waste. 
It governs our lungs as, it, as they breathe in and out air. It governs what we take from air and what we take from food and passes them into the organs so that they're uh, sustained. Nutrients, it's called, right? And it also is there as an all-pervasive force, prana. So there's five kinds of prana. But there's also something called a psychic prana. And this is what this, this teaching and this question gets interesting, is that the psychic prana is not uh, governing these functions of the body, you see. It, if you can connect the physical prana to the psychic prana, then yes, you have a, you, you're beginning to get the idea of how everything is connected inwardly. And, uh, but what you'll find is that when you reach the level of mind, that there's a different kind of energy working there that takes your thoughts here and there, that increases your intellectual potence or decreases it. You know, it's either there or not that causes ebb and flow in your thoughts, even causes ebb and flow in your, in your uh, awareness and meditation. It's a problem, problematic meditation where you have, you go blank, you see. People come back from that, that blank state of mind and say, I think I had samadhi. Mm -hmm. No, no, you went dumb. Samadhi is super consciousness, not no consciousness. So, uh, you can see the importance of psychic prana then. It's kind of an untapped area, you know, for us as Westerners. And uh, even, I'd say, even denizens of the world today is rather untapped, psychic prana. Vivekananda mentions it uh, and brings it out in the Yoga Sutras when he comments on them. Not just prana, which the people who are attached to body and health are all uh, into, but psychic prana. See, so that's why I put together this, you know, food, you get strength. Strength, you increase your stamina. Stamina, you can master your posture and sit like this again. You can then purify your senses. Then you can equalize your breathing. It never occurred to you that your breathing's erratic. And if you equalize it, peace of mind will come back. See? Then prana kicks in. You begin to know about prana and you purify it. That is, you begin to uh, eat better food. You begin to see better. That's that's purifying your prana. You begin to taste better, hear better. You know it has all to do with purifying the prana. Then you control it. Why? Because you want to take that in towards the psychic prana. You raise it up, like you would raise kundalini up the spine. And you frequent holy company, and it gets more refined. And you select a guru, and you secure a mantra. Psychic prana is all of a sudden on you. You see, you cannot deny it anymore. Your life is inward now, you see. That, that's the pillars here, you see. Inner life really begins to get good, as they say, right there, when you have, can control your own mind. Not just control your body like the Hatha yogis can do. Oh, great, I can you know, walk on water, or I can levitate, or I can take my intestines out and wash them in a the stream. You see, big deal. That's just physical stuff, you see. But when you get here, you can control your mind then these yogic powers, which are not occult powers, but which are powers you can use for enlightenment, so come to you. The rain cloud of virtues, dharma, mega, samadhi, they call it in yoga. So going on, because we can't take a lot of time with it, you begin to conduct worship. Now, you might say that here's where you stand up and do walk outside of the zendo and, you know, do some conscious walking, you see. Before, you were just doing it because everyone else was doing it, and you wanted to rest your legs, as I was saying. See? But here, you're actually getting up, and you're conducting worship. I mean, we conduct it here at the shrine. See, we have flowers there, and incense, and candles, and we do pujas, and, you know. So this is called outer puja, and worship, and it's very good for the body and senses and, and ego to do that, see. But it doesn't mean that that's the only way you can do worship. You can do it right out there in nature, if you have the psychic prana awakened, then everything is looking like God to you. you see? It's, it's vibrating with prana. You, you're seeing the pranic element in it. Not just the objects and the wind blowing and the scenes, like a nice sunset or the wind blowing the trees. Oh, I feel so good. You know, oh, that's so cool. You see? I'm going to go sun on the beach. No, none of that. You see? It's this interior life now. I've told you that story before about the Swami who 
walked into this beautiful apartment they'd rented for him with a view of Puget Sound in, up in Vancouver and walked over and shut the curtains. And the person who was with him said, why did you do that, Swami? It's a beautiful view. He says, I've got everything I need inside. My view is inside. That, that's old now. I've seen it a hundred lifetimes. When am I going to get over it? And stars and, you know, shooting up rockets, and popping firecrackers. And, you know, when am I going to get over it all? Because the interior view, you know, all of that that was so fascinating, fascinating to me came out of what's inside of me. I have to see what's inside of me because it's much more satisfying. Well, this is all a way of saying about awakening psychic prana in yourself. And it may be already awakened in most of you, and you're actually uh, you know, learning more to control it. You see? That's why you frequent Holy Company, and you select a teacher, and you get a mantra going. You know, it's all going by prana now, isn't it? And, and a prana of a deeper level. So, I know who sent in this question, so I'm speaking to you now about this connection. They have a word for it in Sanskrit. Manaha, which means mind. Prana, which means life force, both inner and outer. Sambandaha, the way they connect. See How you can connect body, food, and all of these things, breathing, to the prana, to the psychic prana, to the mind, to your thoughts, and get enlightened, or let's say get free. At least get free of most of the things that are troubling you. Maybe the, the ones that are really deeply buried, you're going to have to, you know, awaken her, you see, in Shakti. Prana will lead to Kundalini. You see, it's, it's very similar. It's her power. Prana is her power. They, in the Upanishads, they describe her as, you know, Prana as the web, and she's the spider. And anything that touches the web, she knows where it is and what's happening. And that web is the all the three worlds in space and time, all the lokas, all the beings are on that web. And she knows when any of them moves and breathes and commits a heinous act or a good act or whatever, you see. And she can go right to that place. So you should probably practice calling on her, propitiating the goddess, sometimes they call that, you see. Uh, invoking Shakti power inside of you. But it's probably not going to work until you satisfy some of these requisites. So, good question, and you can. That's why I saw this, uh, in a, you know, sent to me in an email about an hour before I came here. So I grabbed this chart on the way out the door because it's good reviewing it. So, I think we've pretty much answered it. Uh, yes, all thought is manifested. Uh, uh, prana gets manifested by thought. You can connect prana back to thought. Eventually, you're going to connect it back to atman. Prana is the shadow, like a shadow of a man comes out of your body in the sun, you know. Prana comes out of the Atman that way. And so it's life force and it conducts everything from, from a very high level, Shakti power, down to the psychic level of the mind and then all the way out to the earth, see. And you need to connect those. Or at least, you know, connect them means you don't need to know every little thing about them. You need to connect them in here, so you you're aware of, uh, if you want to put it that way, the meaning of life again. <laughs> you know the meaning of life again, but you know it on a very deep level, and you're sure of it. You're assured. See, no more uncertainty. Suffering goes away. You feel peaceful. You feel blissful. Anything that comes as a challenge, you can meet it, and. and and defeat it, and you just live as if you're taking a walk, you know, outside in the zendo, walking consciously. So, but now you're walking inward consciously. You're taking a stroll in your own mind. Our founder actually used to say that. Come, old, come, uh, body, my friend, let's take a walk in our mind, because he knew all of this was mind. Uh, most people don't go out the door thinking, I'm going to go walk in my mind. See, I'm going to go walk in nature. And the trees go by and all of that, you see. But what if you were to know that all of this came out of the mind and all of this was just your thought made manifest? As she said to us, Holy Mother, uh, objects are thought concretized. 
So what if you knew that without a doubt? Well, the only way you would know it without a doubt is if you'd done some connecting. Manaha prana sambandha. I mean, this is an ancient, ancient word, thousands of years older than the Christian era. You could see how they were thinking, or how they were knowing, might be a better way of putting it, of how everything's connected. My f one of my favorite stories of Master reaching down on the lake and pulling a little vine, a hyacinth plant, and the whole plant across the lake came at him by pulling one strand. And he turned to his his companion, his student, he said, just like that, under the surface, everything's connected. See, it's that simple. And there, was, there it was in nature, the perfect way to represent it. Pull that for a half mile across, the whole hyacinth plant that was mostly buried underwater came at him. Just like that, under the surface, everything's connected. How? Like this, see. Well, I don't know. We don't really have a time limit today, but but there are some other questions here that uh, I can take up since we don't have a time limit. We've gone about an hour and 20 minutes. I was going to take an hour and 15, but let's take at least one of these here on this list. Um, Let's take this third one. I haven't looked at these yet. Is all the ignorance, pain, and suffering of this world nothing but fuel for the individual to travel the path toward final liberation? Well, let's just stop there. There's another sentence, but that's a good question just to focus on. That would be called transmuting poison to nectar in, in Tantra. You see, they have this thing. Uh, you know, Lord Shiva with his blue throat, right? You might have seen seen it in images. He's got a blue throat, you see. And he's also sometimes seen quaffing this this liquid from a conch, you see. Because when the ocean of existence was churned by the gods and the demigods, the gods and the asuras, the demons and the gods, you see, good and bad, uh, took the great mountain, put it over, wrapped the great snake around it, churned the ocean of existence, and all of these things started coming out, good and bad, and mixed. And they started grabbing them for themselves, you see. And then they didn't notice this poison was coming out too. So the poison started eating through the foundation of the, of the three worlds, and they noticed that kind of late. Nobody could do anything about it, so they called Lord Shiva. Lord Shiva gathered it all and, and, and drank it. So, and then, you know, Shakti was there, Divine Mother, you see, and she put her hand here so that the poison wouldn't go to his digestive system and destroy him. So it's caught in his throat, and his throat turned blue. That's called Nilkanta. That's a name for Shiva, Nilkanta, a blue-throated one. And that was because he quaffed the poison of re relative existence, this ocean of suffering you're talking about in your question, and took it on, you see. And he's known for being able to trans mute, poison into nectar. So it became a very powerful teaching about living in the human being living in relativity because there's so many poisons here. I mean, we go on and on about the environmental poisons and our food getting sprayed and GMOs and all the current squawk of the day that goes on around our physical existence. But there are many, many negative acts and karmas and thoughts heinous acts and thoughts going on in our mental world, too, right here on Earth. That would be more brains, you see, than mind. Mind is something transcendent of brains in my tradition. But the brains, you see, are all engaged in this relative existence with all its poisons. So gathering all these poisons together, you see, and learning how to transmute them into nectar, ambrosia, you see, Amrit is the word in Sanskrit, became a great teaching and Shiva became the champion of that. He was the exemplar of how to do that. And so beings began to emerge who were masters of life and remover of the miseries of the devotees. See, that's what we say in the puja to our ideals. So we salute those three great beings, Ramakrishna, Sharada, Vivekananda, 
who are masters of life and who remove the miseries of the devotees. May they be pleased to accept all our offerings. And we offer them flowers and food and light, candles, incense and everything. And uh, then uh, they keep us on the path, you see. And they keep our, our ego out of the picture. They save us from ourself, from our small self, you see. And there are ishtams, there are, there are our, uh, chosen ideals. And we live in a world of spirituality, therefore, you see, instead of a world of suffering. Is that escapism? Well, if you saw the nature of the ocean of suffering, you'd want to escape from it, <laughs> I would say. Why, what a strange question. You see. If there's any way to escape from that, you'd want out of it. You see. Especially if you got to see it close up. Because very few of us in, the, in America, the West maybe, but in, a, in America, get to see the ocean of suffering. Uh, we're sheltered. Very, very sheltered. India saw suffering. Vivekananda used to point that out to us when he came here. Says, oh, Americans are drunk with new wine, he would say. But we've seen the horrors, thousands of years of horrors and poverty. And right up to the present time, India was impoverished, you see. So uh, he said that's what makes Hindu, Hinduism a real religion, is all the suffering it went through. If you just go through happiness and opulence, it doesn't really make your religion much of a doesn't give it much of a strength to stand on, you see. And uh, it wasn't much of a religion when Jesus walked the earth either. Anyway, you see, there was no such thing as Christianity when he walked the earth. So <clears throat> this question then is very good for that, bringing out that teaching of how to transmute poison, transmute poison into nectar. And um, to finish the question, this is fine for the soul who is aware of the path, that is, um, transcending this suffering and pain. But what about those who are engulfed in it and are completely unconscious? Well, that's rather the point, I think, of samsara and poisonous existence or even relativity, because even the best life in relativity is not as good as the worst life in reality. <laughs> See, you can suffering a lot, like, Jesus did at the end of his life, or Buddha did in the forest, and so forth. Uh, but if you have your mind on God, that suffering is easy to bear. You see? But you can be living the best life in relativity and put a gun to your head one day and do away with it all. You see, and There's just no ultimate meaning in it. In other words, there's no divine reality in your life, no ishtam. It's a godless world. Uh, yet there is God in and around you and through you as your very self. See? God is mankind. Mankind is God walking around on two legs. Ibukanand used to say that. But now he's going to have to realize that. So yes, all of those who are engulfed in samsara, samsara sagara, the ocean of uh, suffering, um, what's the way out for them? See, the, they're uh, starting to make these important spiritual connections, which is what our retreat is about this this weekend. We'll be retiring near Pahoa there into to a very nice recluse, reclusive place and retreat, and we'll be studying spiritual how to make crucial spiritual connections. But it's very apropos to this satsang. It's why this came along, this chart was brought along, and these questions were also just naturally fell into that. You see. We want to avoid the ocean of suffering at all costs. And uh, because it's ultimately unreal, I'm going back to the very first question, see, basically heinous acts and all that cannot affect the Atman. And we are the Atman. See? We're not the walrus. <laughs> Unless the walrus is realized as Atman, then we can be the walrus too. See? So that kind of realization puts you head and shoulders or far above, you know. It's even above transcendentalism because transcendentalism can be a kind of escape. You want, you want that kind of Zen Buddhist realization that all this is, is Buddha nature. Even taking a cup of tea with my friend, my student, you see, is, is Buddha nature in action. Is God with form. It's not Maya. 
completely. So for this, a way of answering this question too. For those who are completely engulfed in that, everything is Maya to them, and they don't even know what Maya is yet. That's how bad it's gotten. You see, they don't have a word for what ails them. Sort of like having a disease and no doctor can find it. If you ever been in that situation or known a person who has passed maybe months or years having something wrong with them and nobody can find it, not even doctors. That's sort of what living in Maya is like without knowing that Maya even exists. See, this is the, this is the uh, situation of people like this that you mentioned in your question. See. So we need to climb out of that into higher awareness. Any way we can get it and any method we can use that will um, take us out of if you want to put it philosophically, tamas, darkness, into rajas, activity. And that's where America is right now. See? And then into sattva, balance. You know, that's the natural sequence of things. And then beyond sattva to pure sattva, as, as how Shankara put it. You begin to study scripture, you begin, all these things are pure sattva, you see. All of this was sattvic, and then rajasic, and then finally back here, if you're attached just to food, it's just tamasic. You're just, as my teacher used to say, you know, a man does not uh, live to eat, he eats to live. So in order to get true life, you eat, right? And you take the food and you take the energy from it and you do exercises and turn it into ojas, see? spiritual energy. But people who don't, take that food energy up, it turns into, not ojas, but it turns into excrement. That's about all that's left, you see, out of the food eating process. And does the pleasure they get from it last? Once the sweet meat goes down the throat, it's all over. Does hunger ever get satisfied? Does thirst ever get satisfied? So uh, those are some of the um, clouds, you know, the the six clouds of Buddhism, hunger, thirst, growth, birth, death, old age, disease. <clears throat> Those things can never get brought to an end in that kind of existence. So you want to realize your eternal nature to what's beyond those. See, And that's why a person whose mind is on God never gets hungry. Their tooth doesn't ache all of a sudden. See, Their headache goes away. See? And even if they come back down to the body like Ramakrishna came back down to his cancer-ridden throat, would say to a person standing nearby him, I only feel this when I'm talking to you, but as soon as you go away, my mind will go back up to Mother Kali. See, it's been trained to do that. It doesn't want to be like rainwater that seeks the lowest place. It wants to be like a hot air balloon. So you wouldn't want to pull a person down from that high climb. You know, you couldn't actually. They just naturally elevate, see? And that's what Sri Ramakrishna Paramahams was like. It wasn't like he was trying to get in samadhi. He couldn't keep himself from being in samadhi all the time. He was the opposite of us, you see? We're trying to meditate and get these higher experiences and he's like going like this, please come down. <laughs> Oh, Mother, please come down. He'd say and tap the top of his head so that consciousness would leave these higher centers and at least come down to the heart where he could talk with you, you see. And then you're there talking, oh, I have such problems. You see. I said, why? Aren't you the Atman? So, anyway, some things. It's good that we ended with that question. We should end here. But we ended with that question because we began with the question about evil. And we end with the question of suffering. So it's not like, you know, we put kid gloves on as Vedantists and run away from these things. We just have an entirely different way of explaining them. And uh, we explain them away as unreal. And when they happen to encounter us in our everyday life, we drink, we transmute them into nectar. It's an alchemy. It's a spiritual alchemy that you are... Uh, are not only allowed to do, you should, you should become masterful at. There's no reason why you shouldn't be in peace every minute of your existence. And maybe no further reason why you shouldn't be in bliss as well. Peace and bliss. Where rolls the stream of knowledge, truth, and bliss that follows both. Sing high that note, sannyasin bold, say, 
Om Tat Sat Om. The self is Brahman. So Vedanta wants to take you there and hopefully has taken you there even when it comes down to this Atma Vichara level and even when it comes further down to having to answer questions about suffering and evil. It's uh, the superlative way of of, uh, answering from the standpoint of um, the Paramatma, the Supreme Self, and its oneness with Brahman. Always the oneness of man, kind, and God. Never uh, ending up or or, uh, falling as a final conclusion to the two-ness or the many-ness. See, it's always in this innate oneness of the soul, which is an all-pervasive oneness, not a numerical oneness, all-pervasive oneness. So here we will end with our usual chant and end this satsang and then see you again in about two weeks, I think, for our first in a class series of about five classes on Bhagavad Gita. I hope you're all here on Sundays to join us. <coughs> Om Bhadram Om Bhadram Kardibihi Srinayama Devaha Bhadram Pasyema Akshabir Yajatraha Sthirayaraktvantas Tanubir Vyashema Devahi Tam Yadayuhu Svasti Na Indra Vrida Shravaha Svasti Na Pusha Vishwadevaha Svasti Na Starksho Arishta Namihi Svasti No Brihaspatir Dadatu Om Shanti 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 May we see with these eyes what is good and spiritual. May we hear with these ears what is noble and uplifting. And may we, while worshipping the Lord and Mother of the Universe, with healthy minds and bodies, live a life which is beneficial to ourselves and to all other beings. Om Peace, Peace, Peace. May peace be unto us and may peace be unto all. Om Hari Om.